uh, the, a lot of the young people, they were not necessarily, they actually don't know what they want. They, they know what they don't want, right? They, they have a discontent, legitimate concern, legitimate discontent. So they go on protest to express their discontent. But in the end, because that kind of the, 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 the lack of goal and, and the, the, the end game, they just end up being pawns in some. They, they became, you know, they, they became the foot soldiers and the pawns for other other forces who have other agendas to play. But th that that is a good question to ask. Who benefit from destabilization of Hong Kong? Well, the U.S. certainly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you China certainly do not want to see see uh, Hong Kong destabilized. That for sure. I'll never apologize for the United States of America. Ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. This is Moderate Rebels, and this is part two of our episode on Hong Kong and the ongoing violent protest there. We are continued in this second part to be joined by Carl Za. Carl is an expert on China who was born and raised in the country. He is also the host of an excellent China-related podcast you should check out called The Silk and Steel Podcast. In the first part of this episode, we discussed the history, geopolitics, and economics of Hong Kong, leading us up to the situation we're dealing with today, we also talked about the ongoing violent protests. In this part, we're going to talk more about foreign government interference and what's going on inside Hong Kong, the attempt to turn up the heat against Beijing, and then we're going to conclude talking about the new information war going on and the kind of new Cold War between the U.S. and China, and of course, like always, how corporate media propaganda plays into that war. Here is part two. Journalists, they definitely uh, embolden and enable the protester on the ground because they felt, you know, look, we have the support of all the, all the mainstream media. We are on the right. You know, we can do no wrong. I mean, that's why a lot of people, a lot of the tactics they, they use, you know, they, they used is to um, block the trains, block the, block the traffic. They call the general strike, right? And they, um, and I questioned their tactic. I'm like, how is it, preventing, uh, you know, holding up the train and forcing all this inconvenience uh, uh, people on the general population. How is that going to uh, going to help your cause? And people uh, just say, oh, but that's what general strike is about. You know, you, you don't understand. That's how, how it works. But I mean, I thought in politics is you want to get more people on your side. You don't want to like alienate more people. And, and that's what they exactly are doing right there and they don't even realize it because they, they feel they're so self-righteous they feel like what they're doing is so correct people should just why why can't people conform to their way well, it's of not just thinking? that it's this is an age-old color revolution tactic and the idea is to encourage this this crackdown and then to use it to justify foreign intervention and you mentioned that new york times piece i'm going to go back to this really quickly because it explains everything this is really wild it was published at the end of june and it's titled, A Hong Kong Protester's Tactic, Get the Police to Hit You. And the subhead says, Using aggressive nonviolence to provoke the authorities and win over the public. Now that term, of course, aggressive nonviolence. But if you read the actual piece, that he, he says really clearly that the strategy, he says right here, he talking about the marginal violence theory, but it says, Protesters should not, should not actively use or advocate violence, which is ridiculous because they're just redefining violence. They are using violence. But instead, protesters should use the most aggressive nonviolent actions possible to push the police and the government to their limits. And then, of course, so you're, you're mentioning, first of all, they call it a general strike, but it's not a general strike because uh, the point of a general strike is that workers and unions in all of the industries are supposed to go on strike. They're not. Yeah. This is a minority movement. There are not a bunch of workers joining them. The idea is to, like the same thing in Nicaragua and Venezuela, the idea is to grind the country to a halt and hurt the economy, which forces the yeah. government to meet your demands. 
And if the government cracks down, then you demand foreign humanitarian intervention using the R2P yes. doctrine. Yes, I mean, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's that's the same exactly thing they did in Libya, the same thing in Syria, and at, at different levels with war, but it's also what they did in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, and so many other places. It's an age-old, it's a Gene Sharp CIA-style tactic. And another thing I want to call out is that, you know, in the... In the common Western media narrative is presented as the Hong Kongers versus the Chinese government, right? But what they don't tell you is that Hong Kong public opinion about the protest is actually quite divided, right? Um, I, I'm getting, um, so I'm, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, one of the pro-protest uh, person who tweeted in my comments, he says, um, this was a, a was a, a re, uh, response to another uh, anti-protest guy posting uh, videos of people getting angry, being inconvenienced by the train getting held up, um, of saying, you know, like the silent majority finally had enough. Uh, he said, well, actually, you do not have silent majority because according to some polls, it's for 46 percent of the Hong Kongers are against the protest. You know, 53% of the Hong Kongers support the protest. This is data from the pro-protest side, but it shows a clear divide down the middle among the Hong Kong population regarding the protest. But you never see that in the Western media. And I remember the, the BBC reporter, Stephen McDowell, he went to the pro-Beijing rally in Hong Kong, and he just basically called everybody there a mainlander from mainland China. Um, he visited the Hong Kong Association of Tiao, Tiao Chu and the Hong Kong Association, the Hong Kong Fujianese Association. These are basically uh, association of Hong Kongers who originally come from Fujian or originally come from Tiao Chu in, in Guangdong province. Just like how we have like Italian American Association or Chinese American Association in here, right? But instead, um, the BBC reporter just called all the mainlanders, and on top of that, he um, he misunderstood the word for the Chinese word for Tiao Chu because it's very it's kind of similar to the word for Korea, right? So he thought he literally tweeted that these guys are. Chinese Koreans that were <laughs> flew down from Manchuria to Hong Kong to oh to show God. support of Beijing government, right? And and people tell him no, 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 that that's so I, no, you know that's a, so so he finally he admitted. He said, okay, okay, it's just a it's just a it's just a typo, you know. I I misread it, you know. But but they're still I'm mean, like. Well, they're not mainlanders then. They're, they're, they're local Hong Kongers who are, uh, you know, who are against the protest. And, and he responded to me. He said, no, 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 they're, main, they're definitely mainlanders. So there may not be Koreans, but they're still mainlanders. I'm like, how you can, can you claim that? He said, well, you are not there. I was there talking to them. Uh, you know, you, you are not even there. I talked to them. They're mainlanders. So I said, you talk to them and you still call them Koreans from Manchuria? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he blocked me. He blocked me after that. <laughs> so I'm well, blocked I from to make a quick tweet. point too, because Max pointed out that there were all these neoliberal journalists who were justifying the beating and torture of this journalist because he's from Global Well, Science. not all of these, but, you know, there was at least one. There were several. I mean... But there the point is, that, I mean, it was shocking that there was one. I just don't even know what the point of that is. But the, the point I was going to say is hatred. that what's interesting is that every time that there is a an American or Western journalist who is caught spying or doing something, in the case of Nicaragua, working hand in glove with the violent opposition to try to overthrow the government, and every time one of these journalists is deported or detained, it's like the end of the world. And all of these NGOs that are funded by billionaires. Uh, CPJ and all these groups are like, oh my God, this authoritarian regime is, is attacking journalists. But then you actually have professional corporate media journalists or for other state media outlets who are defending attacks on Chinese st state media journalists. And my response is saying, okay, so if you're gonna justify that, I guess that means that China, Russia, every other official enemy of the US government now has the right to detain uh, journalists from U.S. propaganda outlets like Voice of America 
or Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, or all of these other, Radio Free Asia, which was created by the CIA. It sets a really dangerous precedent. And, you know, so does registering RT as a foreign agent, because there are plenty of people working in Russia with VOA who are now registered as foreign agents. And so it sets a bad precedent. It's a, it's a dangerous spiral. I mean, like, where, where does it stop? And, 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 and the, also, like, people just, you know, what about, what about basic humanity? How about, like, don't beat a person half to, to death just because, you know, you, you felt like they need to be beaten, right? I mean, like, what happened to, to rule of law and presumption of innocence, you know? Like, like, like people, people talk about freedom and democracy, but every time they are, uh, their side is, you know, their side is in the wrong, then all that stuff gets chucked out of the window. And, 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 and that's what comes down to in, in Hong Kong right now. Like, I see a lot of conversation on Twitter. It's not even about, uh, it, it's about just like staking a side, right? Like people are saying, this is, I, I support this because, I mean, one of the funny thing is that all these um, Hong Kong protesters waving American flags, right? Yeah. Um, I, I tweeted it because I thought that was funny. Like they were singing uh, American anthem at the airport and, and <laughs> let's, let's, let's play that video right now. Here's a video of them singing the national anthem on megaphones. And a few hours later, you see all these conservative right wing uh, 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 media talking heads retweeting the same video. But they say, but they 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 are posing this. Oh, look. In Hong Kong, they still respect the flag, you know, yeah. unlike some of our athletes who, you know, look, look, these that was uh, Donald Trump Jr. said that. Yes, yes. And, and, and it was tweeted and, and it was also tweeted by Sean uh, Hannity, uh, who, who says and then Donald Trump himself retweeted Sean Hannity of that same video. Well, I was right about to ask you about this. Um, there was a. a uh, alt-right figure, Joey Gibson, who is actually beating up Antifa people in June in Portland. He has this group called Patriot Prayer, and he, he swears he's not a white supremacist, but he showed up at one of the big anti-extradition rallies, live streaming it, waving an American flag, and you know you can hear him saying on the live stream, oh, they love our flag here more than they do in America. You know, So you had an actual alt-right person go to Hong Kong and now you're seeing all of these um, symbols of Pepe the Frog on a lot of the paraphernalia and propaganda that's being distributed in the protest. Are they are they are they influenced by the alt right or do they like Pepe the Frog for another reason? I mean, there was a prominent uh, pro Hong Kong protest person who went on Twitter and says, "Well, uh, you guys you guys shouldn't be so America centric." Right. It's it, the, the Pepe the Frog in Hong Kong just doesn't mean the same thing it does in the United States. I mean, what can I say? So what does it mean? I mean, Hong Kong, Hong Kong people have, you know, there's no great firewall in Hong Kong. Right. Hong Kong people have access to Reddit. <laughs> they have <laughs> access to, to 4chan, you know, like they they know they they have no excuse i i don't think they have they get a pass yeah okay so they they i mean i haven't seen any explanation to indicate that they are not consciously adopting a symbol of the white nationalist alt right and then you know my mentions in any time i criticize the protest tactics or their rhetoric are filled with you know ostensibly progressive or left wing people the kind of people who fulminate over imaginary red brown alliances who are attacking me for for criticizing it but it really appears that this movement in its in its tone and its symbols um in its politics and i would say its ideological agenda is right wing is ideologically right wing well, is that fair to say it's the blue brown alliance between liberal imperialism and fascism and it's the same alliance we saw in ukraine that we see in syria and libya Liberal imperialists supporting fascists. Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, I have to say though, um, 
the people who are openly for Hong Kong independence, uh, uh, waving the American flag, the Union Jack, they are still a minority. That's like the National uh, Party among the protesters. They, but they happen to get the most press attention because what? That's grab eyeballs, right? And and their action get magnified in the press, in the Western media, for various reasons. For mostly for like so stupid reasons, like oh my God, look, they love America over there, and <laughs> and then the, the right wing people say, oh, like well, you know, our own people don't even love America as as uh, as, as as well as these Hong Kongers, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so you you're you're saying that the right wing elements are a kind of vocal minority within the protests. Yes, yes. Um, I, I well, I mean the 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 ones we, who explicitly identify with the kind of the identitarianism, uh, you know, what we we are from more familiar with the uh, with the West. But there's a there's a large nativism element in in the protest. So, so kind of different, like, I, 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 I'm kind of, it sounds like I'm splitting hair right now, but, but there's a lot of, um, definitely a lot of nativist hatred, but the, 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 the people who, uh, specifically, I'm talking about specifically waving the American flag, singing the national anthem, waving the Union Jack, those are a vocal minority, right? But whereas the, the, the native sentiment against the mainlander, that's actually quite prevalent. Yeah. Yeah, and on, on this note, uh, you know, you were saying earlier that <laughs> we shouldn't overstate the U.S. influence, but we shouldn't understate it. And I think what's interesting is there's been a video that's, that's gone kind of viral on Twitter. It's in alternative media outlets. It's gotten some coverage, of course, completely ignored in mainstream corporate media. But it's a former Reagan official. I'm going to play it here. A former Reagan official boasting that many of these groups... Uh, in Hong Kong are funded by the U.S. government and specifically its regime change arm, the NED. Here's the video clip. Chinese pro-democracy demonstrators have taken to the streets in Hong Kong and the Chinese media, state-owned media, has said that it's all the fault of the Americans. Joining us now to make some sense of this is Dr. Michael Pillsbury, a senior fellow of the Hudson Institute and former Reagan administration official. Thanks for joining us. So what do you think? It's all the Americans' fault? It's not all our fault, but we're partially involved. We have a large consulate there that's in charge with taking care of the Hong Kong Policy Act passed by Congress to ensure democracy in Hong Kong. We also have funded millions of dollars of programs through the National Endowment for Democracy to help democracy in Hong Kong. So in that sense, the Chinese accusation is not totally false. And in addition to that video, a colleague of ours, Alex Rubenstein, published a really good piece at Mint Press News uh, right at the beginning of the protest, actually, it was an important piece. It's called American Government and NGOs Fuel and Fund Hong Kong Anti-Extradition Protests. And, and Alex went through and looked at all of these groups that are being put forward as the kind of spokespeople and leaders of the protest movement. And the majority of them receive money from the U.S. government's soft power arm, the National Endowment for Democracy, at the Gray Zone and here at Moderate Rebels, we've done a lot of stuff showing the NED funding, for instance, a lot of these Uyghur groups uh, that are putting out these uh, flawed reports based on like extrapolations of numbers. They talk to like six people and then they multiply times the population and they're like using Radio Free Asia reports. And then we've also, of course, talked about the NED funding the right-wing opposition groups in Latin America and Africa and the Middle East. So maybe could you talk more about who some of these groups are and where they get their fu funding from? Well, uh, I, I talk about the figure Jimmy Lai, right? He's kind of like the Rupert Murdoch of Hong Kong. And he is, uh, he's very wealthy. He, he bankrolled the 2014 protest. Um, uh, the umbrella movement, and, and again, he's he is uh, a big backer of the current protest, and he was also seen meeting with uh, together with Martin Lee, who is the 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 father of Hong Kong democracy, name so name, to meet with uh, the the U.S. officials. Um, we have a you know the, the video clip of the meeting. We don't have uh, the audio, unfortunately. Nobody actually leaked the audio <laughs> of what they actually talk about. But we do know that that such meeting took place, right, uh, um, in a Hong Kong hotel. And 
And we do know that Jimmy Lai is a big backer of the protest, uh, uh, both both through his um, media empire, um, Apple Daily, and and as well as financially. And um, and in fact, he was uh, you know he he was always very tight with the uh, U.S. State Department. In fact, uh, um, his uh, the, the the guy he was really close with, Martin Lee, um, who is the head of the so-called pan-democratic camp in Hong Kong. Um, he, like, the NED um, has, like, a whole biography of him. Uh, 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 <laughs> like, if you go to a, a, search NED and Martin Lee, you know, you'll find it. And, and uh, so, so, but these people are, right now, they're more working the background. In this, this movement, the, the media is portraying this current movement as a leaderless quote right, unquote right. movement, right? And like like all the and even even the people like Joshua Wong who was more prominent during the twenty fourteen uh protest, they're basically their role was uh like on the me they they they're like the public face. They they're like the Bana Alabed. He was like seventeen years old at the time and he was like help us please I am a cute Bana baby boy uh, jo- and then, like, he has some Netflix documentary about him, like teenager versus superpower. <laughs> Except he's backed by the superpower because the NED is like lining up the pockets of uh, what's his group called, Dem- Demosisto. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, so you're saying th- these are just the kind of cute faces, and then you have the leaderless resistance, which is. Another Gene Sharp kind of tactic. Yeah, they say they're leaderless, but what that means is that they can impose any leaders they want on it. So the media determines who the leaders are. They're not chosen by the actual grassroots. And the media chooses the leaders that just so happen to be the groups funded by the NED. Right. right. And, and so one, um, I, was, I, I follow a bunch of Twitter uh, uh, tweet posts from, like the, from Hong Kong who are... Uh, I follow both sides, both both the uh, both the pro protest side and the anti protest side. So there was one anti protest uh, Hong Konger. He he posted something interesting. He said, "Well, hmm, isn't that interesting that for all these talking about disruption, all the all the protesters always show up at this uh, blue collar working class neighborhood." Um, you know, uh, uh, really inconvenience people, but they never go to like the really ritzy, classy, um, like rich neighborhood. Like, like they never go say they 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 say they're against the Hong Kong governor Carrie Lam, but they never went to his her house to 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 demonstrate outside. They never went up to the Victoria Peak, which is the the most elite of Hong Kong residents. Uh, there to protest, you know, they never, they never shut down the the Hong Kong financial district, right? Which is the really the lifeblood of Hong Kong. Um, you know, the Hong Kong, Hong Kong, the financial stock market, financial market is still operating as as it was business as usual. And and he asked, a, I think that was a really legitimate question. Why is it that you know the, most people that are inconvenienced are these working class people just trying to get on the metro right <laughs> it's trying to trying to reach work <laughs> but but not none of these like really um you know these these uh oligarchies that was oligarchs that's really causing you know their 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 their, their problems well so that and and that to you signals who is really guiding the protests well i i think um, so I, I, I like to put put some caveat on that is, is, is the Hong Kong oligarchy is not like a monolithic block, right? There are those that like to see the anti extradition bill abolished because they don't want to they don't want to get uh, you know get extradited for whatever financial misdealings back to mainland, right? But uh, but again, there are most of the oligarchs, they do not necessarily want to see a, a disturbable, like a, a disturbance of the status quo, because status quo is working for them. They they don't like anti extradition bill because that that affect them. They could be right. extradited for for financial misdealing, but they don't actually like to change the system, right? Um, and 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 the also the the oligarchs that who dominate the 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 legislature. Right. They basically made the bargain with with the Beijing government that they 
they bend the knee, right? <laughs> they, they bend. The, 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 I mean, the, they're often portrayed as pro Beijing, but really the oligarchs they're, they're pro themselves. They're pro self interest, and it was their self interest to you know to pledge allegiance to Beijing so they can keep running the show in Hong Kong, right? And 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 I so I think there's a mixture of factors uh, that's that's happening in Hong Kong. There there. The, the, there are certain oligarchs who like to see the uh, anti-extradition bill gone, right? Because that could affect them. But they don't necessarily like to see like an escalation of the protests into more violence that could destabilize Hong Kong, right? right. Uh, but th that, that is a good question to ask who benefit from destabilization of Hong Kong? Well, the U.S. certainly. Yeah, I mean, I mean... Yeah, I mean, you, you China certainly do not want to see see uh, Hong Kong destabilized. That for sure, and and uh, I think for a lot of the protesters, one um, there are a lot there's very very different circumstances, but some superficial similarities between the protesters today in Hong Kong and the student protester of Tiananmen Square protests back in 1989 is that uh, a lot of the young people. They were not necessarily. They actually don't know what they want. They they know what they don't want, right? They they have a discontent, legitimate concern, legitimate discontent. So they go on protest to express their discontent. But in the end, because that kind of the 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 the, the lack of goal and, and the, the the end game, they just end up being pawns in some. They, they became you know they they became the foot soldiers and the pawns for other other forces who have other agendas to play. Which is the same thing in the color revolutions in Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union. You had all of these largely young people coming out and they didn't know what they wanted. They knew they didn't want socialism, but that's because they grew up under socialism. They never knew capitalism. And they were like, give us capitalism, give us American movies and blue jeans. And then of course what they got is neoliberal shock therapy, the excess death of millions of people, the, the complete privatization of the entire economy, the destruction of the health system. So uh, it's actually for Western intelligence agencies and, you know, simply these, these regime change groups like the NED, they actually like it when you have these kind of blank slates of these young protesters because they can... So this uh, is, uh, yeah, everything. this is what Gene Sharp advises. Uh, you can, he says it very openly in interviews. It's in his book uh, and film bringing down a dictator and he uses Otpor, the movement that brought down Milosevic in Serbia as the real kind of laboratory where they were not programmatic. They did not offer a clear program or an agenda. The one thing that they did where they followed his tactics to a T was refuse to negotiate, refuse to adopt dialogue and move towards a zero sum game. And in that situation, they also embraced what he conceived as nonviolence as a tool of hybrid warfare very well, but in every other, almost every other situation, or increasingly, um, when they move to zero sum games in these color revolution situations and these soft coups, it turns violent, it destabilizes entire societies, and uh, destroys economies. And that's why I think Gene Sharp, who's been praised, you know, in the Nation magazine and by Noam Chomsky, um, and was working alongside the CIA throughout his entire career and a lot of these soft power organizations, is one of history's great monsters. I would really recommend everyone watching this to read uh, Marcy Smith's, um, who's a CUNY professor, her uh, recent work on Gene Sharp. Just Google Marcy Smith and uh, Gene Sharp. I don't know, maybe Google suppressed it. So look on uh, DuckDuckGo. She called him like a neoliberal Gandhi. Gene Sharp's neoliberal nonviolence. But that, that I mean, first of all, like, you know, my, is that where we're, we, are we moving to a zero sum game? How do you see this resolving? And uh, the other part of the question, Carl, is that you mentioned, um, you know, talking to people on the mainland who are seeing Chinese citizens in what is technically China rendered helpless, being beaten um, without any protection and getting really angry. What how is China going to respond to this? Yes, I mean right now the Twitter is going crazy showing all these clips of Chinese military vehicles moving to the border of Hong Kong, right? And yeah. and in fact the, the the Chinese state media actually first came out with the video 
of saying uh, the a large contingent of Chinese uh, people's mil- uh, armed police is being deployed to Shenzhen, just the city just across the border from Hong Kong, for large scale exercise, right? And 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 in the language that was very explicit, saying they are going to be uh, training in like anti riot tactics, right? To to prevent any disorder. I think um, this. I believe, my personal opinion, that this is a large show of force, mostly um, for two purposes. One is to um, show that to Hong Kong protesters that that potentially they could uh, intervene, but most importantly, really to satisfy the domestic audience on mainland. Because right now, a lot of the mainland Chinese are very, very angry. Uh, My cousin literally told me, he said, I don't understand why is it like a Chinese person being illegally detained and beaten, um, uh, denied medical service inside airport of his own country without any protection. He he was he was baffled and 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 it's a lot of these average Chinese people who see this on live feed. They, they're very very angry right now. They want PLA to go in Hong Kong and crush the rioters. But I don't think China will do that yet because um, Carrie Lam, the, the governor of Hong Kong, just recently gave a press interview um, a couple of days ago that um, the, 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 the reporter keep on asking her, um, you know, why don't you just say the, the suspension bill is dead, right? Why don't you just say, because the suspension bill is suspended, but not officially withdrawn so so they ask her do you have the authority blah 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 but what she said was actually the chinese uh, the beijing government um told me they have full faith and confidence in me and the hong kong police to handle this situation i think that was a very clear signal that that the chinese central government right now is going to let the hong kong government and the hong kong police to handle the situation well, because they know that if they crack down, it would be feeding into those tactics we were discussing that they spelled out in the New York Times. And this actually reminds me a lot of Syria, where, I mean, Syria is an extreme example with like brutal warfare being waged by numerous international powers. But the thing is, what's wild about Syria, and like the Western media narrative is just so insane, if you talk to people who are living in Aleppo, the majority of Aleppo was government held. And if you, if you ask them what they thought, some of them were actually mad that the, that the government and the army were not actually being even more violent and crushing the Al-Qaeda allied forces in, in occupied eastern Aleppo because they were shooting mortars and indiscriminately attacking uh, neighborhoods, especially like Armenian and Christian neighborhoods inside Aleppo. So, of course, the Western media portrays these governments as if they're these authoritarian regimes but then if you actually talk to people living in the government-held territory, in the case of Ch- uh, Hong Kong and China here, or in the case of Syria or other countries, they actually are mad that the government is not clamping down more. Yes, I mean, the, the, the another side that the Western media ignore is that the Hong Kong society is divided ab- about the protest. Not every, but, uh, not all the Hong Kongers support the protest. They're, they're, they're quite... Uh, uh, according to the pro-protest side, there's at least half of the Hong Kong that doesn't support it, right? And and right now, what the, the a lot of the, the disruption campaign they have done or to disrupt the train, disrupt the traffic, to shut down the airport, they actually managed to alienate a lot of people. You know, like they may have had half of the population supporting them before. I'm not sure about that now. And and from from Beijing's perspective. That's just fine because then the, these these protesters are just digging themselves into a hole here. They're they're losing more and more public support every day, and and whereas if you if you send in say PLA or People's Armed Police in right now, this is exactly what those protesters are aiming for. They're they're going up the escalation ladder to for some some big reaction and now western media can can post this as oh Tiananmen 2.0 you know you already seen uh, some media pundits that, what, oh, wondering openly, oh my God, is this going to be a Tiananmen 2.0, right? I mean, well, like- it's more like hoping openly. It's like, you know, they're on drink number four at the bar with their date and they're kind of like, uh, 
is this going to be, is oh, this going to be it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're like <laughs> anticipating the anticipation is growing and they can't wait. They're, they're uh, thirsty. Yeah. That's, that's oh, what I, I get. I, I, Maybe you want to cut that part out. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. That's the what. That's going a back. A few, that's a feeling I get from the Western press. They're hoping for a full on PLA yeah. invasion. And yeah, yeah. what I see based on, um, you know, Ben keeps bringing up the examples of Nicaragua and Venezuela. And I think they're, they're apt in a lot of cases in, in Nicaragua when the opposition embraced the, the tranque, the, the, the roadblocks where they put criminal elements at roadblocks and started extorting, torturing, burning, killing motorists, police, average people, and especially Sandinistas. Uh, that really dealt a strong hand to the government because the public turned against them. And in Venezuela with the Guarimbas, um, when Nicolas Maduro... In, it called for a constituent assembly, uh, the Guarimbas were dead and the public came out and said, let's, let's have a vote and let's get rid of this national assembly that's been stoking this violence. And, you know, I see a similar situation possibly on the horizon here, but in both of those cases, the failure of the opposition led to U.S. sanctions. So you could see an intensification of brinksmanship in the trade war with the U.S. and China after this, because besides the, you know, hard on for a PLA invasion that a lot of the U.S. press and bipartisan foreign policy consensus in Washington has, you also have this kind of talk of like Donald Trump needs to do something. Donald Trump needs yeah. to say something. And they don't even say exactly what, you know, what Trump should do. I mean, what practically could Donald Trump do in this point? I'm going to read a tweet. Uh, and it really shows you how Trump is pissing off the national security state. I know President Xi of China very well. He's a great leader who very much has the respect of his people. He is also a good man in a quote-unquote tough business. I have zero doubt that if President Xi wants to quickly and humanely solve the Hong Kong problem, he can do it. Personal meeting? So Trump is actually talking about diplomacy, which is anathema to the whole way the national security state and the militaristic corporate media thinks. I don't know what the hell else he can do, though, and I don't think he does or anyone else does. And, you know, everyone's like oh, t saying to me, like, you're not going to say anything about these Hong Kong police. Like, what does me saying something practically do? So I don't see anywhere else this can go except a de-escalation and except the public kind of turning against what took place at the airport. What do you think? Is yeah, I think, you know, this is... Um this might be a we might be at a turning point right now after the really ugly violence at the airport. At, at this point, the 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 protester can either choose to escalate further, um, potentially alienate more people, or or, or stand down. And and uh, in the end, you know, it's <laughs> so well, I think you will, you know, like a, a, another comparison might be the yellow vest yellow jacket protest in france which has been gone going on for what 30 30 weeks and well i only follow u.s media so i don't know what you're talking about i've never heard of it <laughs> <laughs> so i mean like they they there are they're not um re, re, they're of course are not being covered extensively like hong kong protest is in, in mainstream e eventually uh, you know, they just get less and less people involved. People are demoralized, and then then uh, it becomes smaller and smaller in scale. And then people um, get tired of all the disruptions to their normal routines. And and that's that's gonna. I think that's probably more likely what's gonna happen. Uh, before we wrap up here, I have a question about the media. We were we were talking about how awful the Western corporate media is. There's nothing new with that. But I'm also interested if you can explain some of the nuances of the Hong Kong media, because I've noticed, at least in the English language Hong Kong media, that most of it is pretty anti-Beijing. And what's interesting is that uh, I've seen some of these liberal pundits refer to specifically the South China Morning Post as a pro-Beijing paper, specifically because... I mean, it's, it's Hong Kong's major newspaper, and it's owned by the Alibaba Group, which is owned by the billionaire Jack Ma, who also happens to be a member of the Communist Party of China. So I've seen some liberal Western journalists say, oh, this is, this is a, a mouthpiece of the CPC. But if you read, if you read the, the SCMP, the South China Morning Post, it's very clearly 
very critical of Beijing and supportive of the protests. And I also noticed this group, there's this new kind of vice style, small media outlet called Inkstone. And Inkstone actually, it says at the bottom of its website that it's actually owned by the South China Morning Post. And Inkstone is actually founded by former New York Times and Vice employees. And Inkstone has been doing these kind of Vice style videos on the ground with like shaky cameras and really, really pumping up the protest. So can you talk about the, the media climate inside Hong Kong? Yeah, uh, yeah basically um, that media climate in Hong Kong hasn't changed significantly after 1989 Tiananmen Square protests. After 1989, basically the entire Hong Kong media is against Beijing, except like a couple of newspapers. Like there are, there are pro-Beijing newspapers. There are Da Gong Bao, there's uh, uh, the Wen Hui Bao, but they're all Chinese language newspapers. There's like in English, <laughs> there's no pro-Beijing English media in, in well, Hong Kong. Well, this is an Kong. obvious proof of, this is proof of the dictatorship that doesn't allow freedom of expression or press. Right, right. Uh, and and. And South China Morning Post actually had its origin as an expat paper. It was it was founded by ex yeah. It used to be owned by Rupert Murdoch. Oh yes, 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 yes. Um, it was it was uh it was founded by expat. It was run for expat. I mean, it was the main audience originally was expat, and it was only recently acquired by Alibaba. Oh, which is owned by Jack Ma, but when Jack Ma uh, assumed ownership of um, S uh, SCMP, South China Morning Post, he promised he will leave the editorial, give give the full editorial independence to the to the newspaper. Which, uh, after a couple years after the fact, that looks to be the case because um, the tone in South China Morning Post is still pretty anti-Beijing, <laughs> if you, if you read it. And, 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 and like a lot of the, the journalists on the ground employed by S, uh, SCMP, they are local Hong Kongers and many of them are pro protest. And, and you can watch, you can, I follow a couple of them on Twitter just to get like more on the ground, uh, you know, the more, more live feed of the situation. And, and yeah, there, there's really no pro Beijing <laughs> voice in the Hong Kong, Kong media landscape, which uh, means, uh, yeah, like like you said, like if Ch if if Ch Hong Kong freedom is somehow uh, under threat, I don't know, I don't know what that means because you know they, they're having huge, they had the huge uh, peaceful protest before that was allowed. They have all these anti Beijing media. That that was the full blown and and you know the only thing they're protesting was the the trigger was an anti extradition bill which was suspended and <laughs> and 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 like but like I explained earlier really the, the the underlying sentiment was the uncertainty and the discontent you know they they seek a certain outlet and unfortunately that outlet has been you know directed into nativism, right? And and the, the kind of uh, really ugly nativism that we saw. Yeah. I, I have one one uh, last question, which might take the form of a short rant. Um, and, you know, we haven't really done China on moderate rebels. Um, we certainly haven't done it to the extent that we should. Um, and it's obvious that we're moving into a new Cold War with China, um, you know, we talked a lot about Russiagate and Russiagate was really something that fell on fertile soil within elite liberal circles, kind of the East Coast intelligentsia just lapped it up and they fell for the whole thing of, you know, Putin's responsible for the uh, rise of the alt right and he's responsible for uh, the take the knee protests in the NFL and just all the instability and all the fake news, yada, yada, yada. yada. But uh, a lot of the Republicans didn't go for it. Right wing media didn't really go for it because it was an attack on Trump and they kind of yeah. put up a fight. But on the on the issue of China, I'm really seeing a consensus here and not just the usual yeah. bipartisan consensus where like Kamala Harris and Newt Gingrich agree. But, yeah. you know, a consensus between like actual kind of left progressive media yeah. personalities and hard right personalities. I saw some left, kind of left of center journalist who's, 
you know, supports AOC and the squad saying that they yeah. want to see China confronted. And one of the yeah. things that really stirs up people on the left is all of this talk of like 70 million Uyghurs in concentration camps or whatever the number is. It fluctuates daily. Uh, I'm not depending, doubting. Depending on what Radio Free Asia reports. Actually, I have an update on that because China just announced that they are closing uh, all the all the vocational training centers um, because they 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 said um, the the original per the, those, those centers have served their original purpose. Um, now the people have been rehabilitated and all all sent home. So this is not reported in the Western media because well, we are we're still kind of time lag here right and i, I think um, there was kind of silence on that issue Uyghur issues lately for a couple reasons one i think maybe um they're trying to come up with some evidence to refute china's claim and and maybe figure a way to how to spin that and and then the second reason is uh, is just because Hong Kong happened, you know, <laughs> all, the, right. all the media sources. Well, and on this subject, Carl, I would recommend any listeners and viewers to check out his podcast. Carl saw, uh, saw, did a really good episode on the Uyghur issue, and he pointed out that, and I have a piece at the Gray Zone pointing out that if you look at the actual numbers of the people who were supposedly held in these re-education centers, the numbers are, like the numbers of supposed detainees who were supposedly tortured to death in Syria, the numbers are based on averages that they just multiply by the number of days or cities. So in the case of uh, the, the Uyghurs, uh, you had Radio Free Asia, which is a U.S. government propaganda mouthpiece that was created by the CIA after the, the Chinese Revolution, and Radio Free Asia and these U.S.-funded so-called human rights groups just went and talked to some people in Xinjiang and then asked who in your family has been in one of these centers. And then they took that that number of people and multiplied it by the population. They, they talked to eight people, eight people, each from one village. So they talked to uh, eight people, uh, each from a different village. So from a different village in the neighborhood of Kashgar in southern Xinjiang. And then they, they based on that data extrapolated to the whole population of Xinjiang and that's how they arrive at their figure. So right now there are two big report uh, on, on the Uyghur issue. One I already talked about in the, my podcast um, is, uh, is the, the, the report by the China human Chinese human rights defenders Defender, who yes. are funded by yes. who were funded entirely by foreign governments, mostly by the US government. And you can find uh, my report at the gray zone where I show all of the tax documents proving that they're they're funded by the US and then also all of the the board of directors members are just like neocons and anti-China activists. Yes. But I get I get flagged for not talking about the other report that was also, you know, the, the other big report, which is by Adrian Zenz, right? Um, it, it's because that Adrian Zenz report actually came, was published after uh, I made my, my podcast. That's why I wanted to do a, um, like a more update, uh, like another podcast update on the Uyghur issue, because I didn't get to cover the Adrian Zenz report on the on my previous podcast, because I didn't know it, it existed out there back, back then. And the Adrian Zins report, I have looked at it, dissected, read it. It was a lot more details. Uh, you cited the satellite intelligence um, of like the, the, the facilities and stuff. But I, I look at the actual numbers. Um, it was still extrapolation. It was still like a number based on a, a Turkey, a, a, a Uyghur exile group in Turkey. Um, and and, and the, the basically... Nobody, the, 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 so basically the 1 million, 2 million, 3 million number, they just made it out of a hat, pull it out of a hat, and, and, and nobody has the exact number. So, but, but let me, let me pre preface that. Like if, even if there were, uh, let's not argue on numbers, even if there were 20,000, 30,000 people uh, wrongfully detained, that would be terrible. That will still That's be bad. terrible. That. But but the, the, back to the numbers that three million to what two million one million now somebody are saying like seven million or whatever 
that number is completely made up. That was just, there was no basis for that number. This is the same thing that these fake Western human rights groups did with Syria. I mean, it's the same thing with China. Like the Chinese government did not dispute that they had these re-education facilities for extremists. And, you know, you can criticize that policy, but they're, they're not concentration camps. And it's the same thing that happened in Syria. The, the government hasn't disputed that it has tortured people. Like everyone knows the Syrian government has tortured people and killed people in this war. But what is, is disputed is that they, they tortured 400,000 people to death or whatever the figure is, depending on this week. Well, uh, yeah, I wrote about it in a piece at the Gray Zone on the Syrian Network for Human Rights, which is appears to be a Qatari opposition organization posing as a human rights group. And Human Rights Watch depended on them in their big report on the Sednaya prison center and how many people were tortured to death. And you know, they, they used uh, uh, extrapolated figures based on uh, abstract mathematical calculation after interviewing uh, about like 13 or 20 people and they, maybe less, and they only documented something like 50 deaths, which, you know, that's bad. But anyway, my, my, I mean, my question wasn't about the, I'm glad we went down the rabbit hole a little bit for listeners who constantly hear about the Uyghur issue, but I, I just think the Uyghur issue has fallen on fertile soil in the left. Also, a lot of um, Muslims living in the West get really uh, worked up about it, and they wonder why aren't ostensibly Muslim governments doing anything? Why are they standing with China? Why is Pakistan and Imran Khan going along with China? Um, and then on the right, you know, they hate China because you know they hate Chinese immigrants, they hate socialism, yeah. communism. So there's just a consensus there. And so, yeah. and, and John Pilger has a film coming out, The Coming War on China. Is this, is this consensus that we're seeing um, that, that's getting consolidated around Hong Kong, does this really signal a more intense Cold War with a bipartisan, with bipartisan support going forward for the next several decades? And, you know, what, what form does it take? Yeah, I mean, so this is, I, again, I, I think... The, this this right now is mostly at a elite level because I mean I, I lived in U.S. for almost I don't know 20 30 years 30 30 years now and and uh, you know when I talk to average people average people think going to war with China is crazy or even any kind of confrontation with China is crazy but then in the in all the media outlets in all the mainstream media you see. You see people just making all these hyperboles about China, and a lot of them is based on very little actual facts or or evidence. I mean, like you have people in Washington talking about China who never been to China or or only been to China for several years. I mean, there's there's just like really critical lack of knowledge about China. Uh, you, you you know, in general, it's like. Um, it's not all our so-called China experts, other than the great Gordon Chan. Um, I mean, they, they're, they're basically they're basically some American grad students who lived in China for several years, right? And then, you know, maybe learn the language. Suddenly, oh, they're the they're China expert. I mean, imagine the opposite, right? Imagine some some Chinese grad students come to U.S. for for a couple of years who who just barely learned the, the language and now they're suddenly the, the, the American expert back home and and like uh, no actually that wouldn't happen because a lot more Chinese people know you know have traveled abroad you know they, they have more knowledge of English language than say Americans have language the language ability of Chinese so so there's kind of um, like asymmetry here, right? Like, like the the the, 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 the a lot of the misconception about China it just breeds this kind of paranoia and uh, this environment where where information gets very easily manipulated. But right now, um, you know, the, the especially the U.S. defense industry, the the, the Pentagon has been looking for. Uh, like a reason, f looking for a big, scary enemy ever since the collapse of Soviet Union, right? I mean, like the, the China threat was proposed right after the collapse of Soviet Union in, in 1990s. But back then, China was, you know, was still pretty weak. <laughs> China was really not, didn't 
fill the shoes of the Soviet Union. But now, uh, you know, 20 years later, suddenly 30 years later, suddenly China is very economically strong. And oh, my God, it, it's a. Uh, it's almost like a peer competitor, which is perfect for the Pentagon because now they actually have a have a more believable China threat, right? With with China on the rise, and and if you look at all these um, people, um, basically all agreeing to confronting China. If you look at what they talk about, the underlying theme is one thing: China is bad because it threatens the U.S. hegemony. Of the world, and that's bad because the U.S. hegemony is good because U.S. 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 is a benign force. You know, Pax Americana is legitimately, objectively good. That, that that's kind of the premise, underlying premise of all these uh, articles coming out. Yeah, Jim Shudo of CNN just told me that on Twitter. So <laughs> I saw it's, that exchange. Yeah, it's, he's, he's very. Uh, really a deep thinker <laughs> uh, a lot of these a lot of these people are really once you once you really scratch the surface of their you know they look like you know corporate mannequins on tv but once you scratch the surface you really see how erudite they are and how complex their thinking about the world is i'm being completely sarcastic uh jim shudo is like the men's warehouse mannequin of u.s empire yeah. he was attacking max and he was like you don't know anything about history. Read Gulag Archipelago, and, and it's like, by the way, Gulag Archipelago is literally a work of fiction. It a work is a of novel. Fiction. It was a no. It won the Nobel Prize for fiction, yeah. I think, for literature. And it's also written by a far right monarchist who wrote, who was a deep anti semite, who wrote a book blaming all of Russia's problems on Jews, and also who strongly supported the Vietnam War and wanted to nuke Vietnam, and also Solzhenitsyn, the author. He also was a strong supporter of Francisco Franco, the Spanish dictator. So these are the figures that the liberal pundits at CNN are falling back on. And, and if you, but it's the, it's the ignorance and the inviability um, that's being punctured by through the kind of confrontation they're engineering with China, which is you know increasingly on par with the U.S. at least economically. And I think that's a dangerous scenario. Hello. Oh, um. Yeah, I don't know what happened. My uh, my my thing just suddenly the, froze. The CIA, and it's it's obvious that the CIA inter intercepted the call and didn't like what you were saying. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, there we go. So, uh, last question: uh, Who killed Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! But I, I was just commenting that it is really dangerous uh, when you considering the class and the mindset of people who really hold the microphone in our media, the kind of the mindset of the people in government and the inability of a lot of people on the quote unquote left to really see through what's happening. Um, the confrontation with China is that's looming is really dangerous. Um, you were, you were suggesting it could move towards something kind of conventional. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think you will, will have us see a World War II replay here. I mean, this is not like a replay of the Pacific War here when China, both China and United States are nuclear powers and with ICBMs to deliver the warheads. Uh, you know, like I, I, I used to play computer games, right? I, I don't know if you guys had heard of the uh, game Fallout, right? Like the, the whole premise of Fallout series of game was that U.S. and China got into a big nuclear exchange, and, and, and people trying to survive the nuclear apocalypse. And uh, you know, sometimes I joke about that. I say, you know, like I, I have a lot of experience uh, role playing the Fallout games. You know, I can I can LARP Fallout in uh, any time in real life. Um, but I think probably more more likely scenario is going to be. A uh, lot of lot of tension, a lot of a uh, proxy war level conflict, like what we see in Hong Kong right now, like what what they call what the fourth generation war warfare or whatever, hybrid warfare, yeah, unconventional yes. warfare, yes, um, and 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 also you know part of the what the the U.S. campaign was, uh, um, you know, like the, like the Uyghurs, they they, I mean, there there's some legitimate issues in China itself, you know, China China is not. 
not Snow White. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not Wisconsin or Minnesota even, right? But like, but like the. But the, the aim of a Ch- U.S. State Department and Pentagon is really to weaken a uh, uh, a peer competitor that's that's rising to challenge the, the U.S. hegemony, and and they see they could do that by um, working on like peripheries, like 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 places like Hong Kong or like Xinjiang, right, 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 possibly um, things that could. Um, create domestic headaches for China, right? I mean, U.S. is never going to send its Marines to, <laughs> to, to land on the shore of Hong Kong to liberate it. I mean, but, but U.S. can definitely send some funds or, or give it media help to, um, to foment more trouble, to more headache for China. I think I that, say, that's probably... I say like, we send Jim Shudo to liberate it. Uh, he goes first. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> we all agree on that point. All these chicken hawks have to be the first people to sign up for the war. I'll pay for his parachute. I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll set up a Patreon for his parachute. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think this is a good good point to wrap up. We were speaking with, with Carl Za, who is a China expert, born and raised in the country, an actual China expert. We were talking about the fake ones. And also uh, the host of the excellent podcast, Silk and Steel. I would highly recommend the Silk and Steel podcast to anyone who's watching or listening. Uh, Carl, can you tell people where they can find your podcast and and some of the work you do? Yes. um, You can just uh, go to Google, search for Silk and Steel podcast, or you can just search for my name, Carl Za. Carl spelled with a C and... C A R L and then just my last name Z H A that's spelled Z like zebra H like Henry A like apple. Um, so if you search Carl Zah, my podcast will either be the the first or the second link. Because uh, I had two, I had a pre pre uh, a prior podcast also called Clash. Because that will probably come up as well. You know, my old uh, Uyghur episode was in was in Clash. Um, I, I made all my Clash episode basically free for general public. Uh, it's worth to listening to all the archive one. But I do plan um, a, a new update on, on the Uyghur situation in China. And I'm also going to do another upcoming episode on, um, on Hong Kong issue itself on my, my podcast. So uh, people welcome to. Excellent. Well, looking forward to that. Thanks for enlightening Great. us. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was yeah, that was really informative. Thank you very much. And also follow me on Twitter. My name, Carl Za, just Carl, spell with a C, and my last name, Z-H-A, Z, uh, like zebra, H like Henry, A like Apple. Thank you, guys, again. Thanks a lot, Carl. Of course, the pleasure is ours. Thanks a lot. And you have been watching and maybe listening to Moderate Rebels. You can support us. Um, I'm Ben and Max Blumenthal. This show is entirely produced by the two of us. We have no external support, so if you want to help support these kinds of in-depth interviews and discussions, you can go to patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And of course, you can find our show on YouTube, and you can find the uh, audio version on iTunes, Spotify, everywhere else. Thanks a lot for listening, and we're out.